All right. Well, um, welcome everybody to workshop number two of the Microsoft Power Platform Accelerator. Um, today we're going to um, put on our BA hats. We're going to be business analysts for the day and talk about business process optimization. So let me sort of level set on where we're going today um, because it's it's um, we're going to sort of um, move through a couple of different steps. First, we're going to talk about business process mapping. Um, then we're going to put those that BA hat on and think about how you would uh, identify opportunities to actually improve your business processes. And the reason why we want to do that is because we want to avoid rework once you really start to get into Power Automate and you start building out your workflows. We also don't want you to get frustrated because you get to a certain step or action in the workflow and you get stuck and you don't know where to go um, because it can start to get confusing with the loops and the calls. And so it's better to commit it sort of to paper uh, in some way, shape or form or to a, a virtual whiteboard um, first before you really get in and start um, playing with Power Automate in the workflows. And I know that's a that's against some of our inner nature to just sort of dive in and get started. Um, but it, it, it's quite important and hopefully you'll you'll see why through this presentation. Uh, I promise you I'm not going to be in slides sort of talking about these concepts for very long. Um, we're going to get to the, the ultimate place here about translating business process maps and start building flows in Power Automate. So Jim's going to be our, our director for that. Um, hopefully you all had a chance to um, practice importing a flow uh, and were able to do that successfully. So for today, again, process map definitions, sort of process mapping techniques, ways that you can facilitate building a process map with your team, um, and then getting into the chunk of it of moving those business process maps to workflows in Power Automate. And then we'll carve out a few minutes at the end after Jim's presentation to sort of talk about homework and next steps and project status and all of those good things. A process map definition um, as <laughs> before we get into this, the reason why we're sort of putting you through the, these conceptual stages is because this is what we often see happen with technology projects. Um, Jim, Zalia, myself, and Trevor were solutions engineers and solution architects. So um, we listen to customers kind of sharing their business requirements, their needs and challenges, and help them envision a future using Blackboard solutions and technology. And we often have to warn against this syndrome, right, of sort of rebuilding a house um, that maybe wasn't all that great to start out with. And so by taking sort of a step back and looking at your business processes in a visual way, um, bringing in your stakeholders to sort of look and validate the steps can open up a world of opportunities to actually completely transform and improve those business processes. Um, automation is uh, just a small part of this, right? Um, but uh, it, it's an important piece. But if you don't sort of understand the big picture of the business process first, you can invest your time in sort of the wrong things. So the benefits of taking a step back and looking at process mapping is it's going to help you save valuable time when you can eliminate extra steps in the process. There, there might be steps there that with the, the, the value of automation can be completely removed because you can trust that the robot is going to do things correctly. Um, it can make the process visible and really shine a light on gaps in the process or not or a lack of shared understanding across your different teams and departments about how a business process works. So if you can take a moment, you can start to break down some of those organizational silos and sort of get down to the, the nitty gritty of what people are really trying to achieve through the process. Um, if you map sort of your current state process and then look at the future, it allows you to set some benchmarks around the measurement of the impact that you're making through your, your business improvement projects. 
So for example, if you can look at a currency business process and say, this process takes approximately 20 minutes of an um, FTE's time, one time a week today. And our goal is to get that to, to zero, right? Or to 10% of that. Um, it can help you sort of articulate the business value of what you're doing um, and, and articulate that up to your leadership and, and executives and let them sort of free up more time for you to invest in these types of activities. And then if, as we talk about Power Automate, if you document the process logic, right, and the data requirements that you're going to need prior to going in and building the workflow, it's gonna save you a lot of time because you'll know sort of all of the variables that you need to set, the actions or API calls that you're gonna to need to make to sort of round out the data you need to move through the flow at the beginning. Um, because when you go back and try to add some of that in, um, because of some of the quirks of Power Automate, it can mess up part of your flow. So not to scare you, but it's good to sort of at least chunk that out on paper um, before you go into Power Automate. And it, if you have it on a piece of paper, um, it's going to help you translate and rename those actions into Power Automate as well, because it can, in very complicated workflows, it can start to get really confusing when you have sort of the same calls that are called the same thing, unless you sort of rename what's happening in that step. Um, and Jim's going to demo that today. So again, maybe a little boring, but incredibly important part of the process. You're laughing, Jim, but you know. Uh, yeah, it, that, that sounded like I'm going to demonstrate confusion. So let me work on that. <laughs> You're going to be the first time. Tactics <laughs> to avoid confusion. There you uh, go. That's what you're going to do. <laughs> so a process, very simply, is a series of repeatable activities that are performed in a specific order to transform an input to an output. So in Power Automate speak, you know, the inputs could be data, it could be lists from Razor's Edge NXT, as we, we talked about last week. It could be criteria, right, when a certain criteria or threshold is met. It could be a variable, right, something changes within the data. Um, it can be a trigger. So at a certain time, something happens um, or uh, on a certain day of the week, something happens. And then the process is sort of all of those workflow steps. That's that's pretty easy to understand. Um, and then the output or the outcome of the process can be that you're creating new data, right? Or you're transforming data. You're taking several data points and turning it into an engagement score, for example. Um, or there's a deliverable. There's actually a merged letter <laughs> that emerges on the other side of the process that is gonna be mailed to the donor. Or as we get into the workshop next week, it could be a report or a notification that's delivered by email with the latest gifts. So we're thinking about sort of what is all the data? What are all the criteria? What are all the variables? What is the trigger or the schedule, right? What are all the steps? And then ultimately what's the outcome or the output of the process? So, you know, back in the day, um, we used to all get together in a room with sticky notes and sort of map out business processes together. Um, maybe one day we'll get back to the sticky notes and the bad coffee. Um, but today, more often, it's sort of whiteboarding, right, within a Microsoft Teams meeting or, you know, building out um, a process flow map in Microsoft Visio or Excel or PowerPoint or Word or whatever your your chosen tool is, um, but it, it can be just an incredibly useful part of the process, even if it doesn't look pretty like this, even if it's bullet points scratched on a piece of paper. Um, this is a business process map that one of our students produced as a as a homework assignment. Um, this was, you know, one of the business process improvement projects um, that that she wanted to undertake. Um, so really sort of thought about what are all of the steps and the approvals and the logic and the conditions that you go through in, in mailing out a gift acknowledgement. Um, there's probably more here than you realize and a lot of things that you just sort of do implicitly, but you have to remember that you, you've got to teach the robot to do it. The robot is not a human and you've got to teach it every little nuance and step in here. Um, or your flow will not have the expected result. 
So putting our BA hats on, um, you know, thinking about your business improvement projects and, and really giving it a definition, um, making sure you understand sort of who are all of the stakeholders or end users in this process. Because right now you're probably focusing on, you know, the tasks that are most mundane in, in your day to day, right? But as you sort of scale up and move out and capturing requirements of other teams, you're going to realize that you're going to have to sort of facilitate this with other end users um, and other stakeholders. Um, and so having a visual can be a, a really useful element to sort of validate and, and control the scope of a particular business improvement project. Making sure you're really clear on sort of what the output or the outcome is. What is the action do you want your end users to take um, when you've had, when you've delivered that output or that deliverable? And making sure that you think about where the process starts and stops. So it might be that you're just focusing on a small piece of a larger business process, and, and that's totally fine. Um, but understanding sort of what's in scope, um, and then you can build out from there. The nice thing about Power Automate is that you can actually combine flows into one larger flow, or you can have the output of one flow trigger something in another flow. Um, so you can be iterative and sort of agile in your approach. And the key here, maybe it should have been number one, but down here at number five is really think through what are all of the data or the inputs that are going to be required for each step in your flow, because you're going to need to call the Razor's Edge database in order to retrieve that data, in order to use it, transform it later on in your flow. So sort of writing that all down up front can be helpful. So as again, as we start moving from concept to, to actuality and power automate, you know, and looking at a business process map, these are some of the traditional shapes, right? But as they manifest in power automate, a start would be a trigger, right? Is this an automated flow? Is this an instant or manual flow? Or is this something that runs on a schedule? We're going to look at lots of actions, right? This is any place where work is performed, pretty much the meat of the workflows in, in Power Automate. This is where you're going to be calling Razor's Edge NXT or calling SharePoint or calling OneDrive um, in order to retrieve and, and transform data. We're also going to get into conditions. So there are several different types of conditions um, in Power Automate. We're going to be working with two main ones through this course. Um, the yes, no condition, so setting a criteria or a standard um, and then saying yes, it meets the standard or no, it doesn't meet the standard. So, for example, did the, did the uh, donor request a mail receipt or an email receipt, right? If it is a mail receipt, then we're going to proceed with a workflow for a mail process. If it's the email, we have a different process or there can be more than one sort of um, variable on a criteria, and that would be called a switch. That's called a switch condition, and we're going to look at that today. Um, and variables. So variables down at the bottom, that's the, the other key one. So we're going to learn how you need to call variables. Essentially, those are holding cells um, that you're going to use to sort of store data that you're going to use at some other point in time in the flow. So you're going to see that um, as we go through the process today. Um, and in some cases, many of you have projects where you need to, to set a variable, right? And then iterate on that variable as you go through the flow. So um, that's another really important concept. So get used to the, this language of triggers, actions, conditions, and variables. So this is another student project, a very ambitious student. Um, mapped out their entire business process end to end um, for so they work with organizations that are delivering site saving surgeries, um, cataract surgeries to those um, who need them. And if you can imagine during um, COVID, um, the, the tax on their their free surgeries has been high. The demand has been very high. Um, and so this has become sort of not able to scale their current process that's very um, paper-based today. So in this process, um, 
you know, we could have started at the beginning and sort of worked our way chronologically across, but instead the student worked with their program manager, sort of honed in, you know, where, where's the biggest bottleneck in this process? Where, um, where do you spend the most time? Where is our level of service to our beneficiaries sort of at the lowest point? Um, and everybody sort of, um, honed in on this sort of place. So this was at the one area where um, there are volunteers who are stored in Razor's Edge NXT um, are being matched to eligible patients based on location. So we spent the entire time working on this project of actually you know, looking and analyzing the distance between every new eligible patient in the Razor's Edge NXT database and putting sort of the, the volunteers within a hundred mile radius in a sky add in tile directly on the constituent record and automated some communications back to the volunteer and back to the patient that they had found matches. So again, it could be part of a very large business process and you can hone in on just one little piece. And so some of the questions that you might ask yourself in identifying these opportunities um, and, and putting that BA hat on. And Nozalia, this is something that um, you uh, guide your customers through all the time. So I thought you might like to, to share on this slide and give a different voice. They've been listening to me for far too long. Thinking of the processes that are taking place, um, you know, are there activities that are happening that we want to to modify and those automations? Um, what are we, you know, what are we trying to achieve? What is our desired outcome? Um, at the end of the day, we know we want to cut back on, you know, the amount of time that we're spending on that activity. Um, establishing automations and, and making sure that it's consumable um, without creating a lot of additional work for, for individuals to, to consume that information. Um, I think in, in one example that we discussed is, you know, do you have forms that are collecting information electronically, but it's not actually moving into your solution. Um, so part of the exercise that we're going through with Accelerator, and Heather has touched on this, is while we're demonstrating using a Microsoft form, you may already have an application that you're utilizing that's part of the connector that you now will have the ability of integrating with your solution. Um, so remember that we are giving you examples and the connector is going to let you know what's what's available in the entire stratosphere of what um, Microsoft Power Platform has to offer. And then you're going to adapt it um, to your existing solutions and, and leverage our exercises throughout the, the program to connect that data. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, you know, to sort of summarize, you know, look back at your flows and ask yourself some of these questions, um, including sort of does the technology or are the endpoint, right, the API endpoint, the action or call exist, right, that we might be able to skip, the, skip this step altogether, or um, if it doesn't exist, do we need to find a viable workaround in the process that's going to get us to the same output? So um, thinking critically about it so that you don't get frustrated and start building something out that then you realize you got to go back and start again because you haven't thought through sort of how to surmount the hurdle of a, of a gap um, in, in the flow. And to Zalia's point, you know, we're going to move now sort of in the presentation for today in Power Automate. We're going to focus on an intake process um, with um, Microsoft Forms. You all should have access to Microsoft Forms with your 365 license, but that may not be sort of what your engine is for intake, right? So um, we're just going to use that as an example, and hopefully the concepts that we're going to go through today are going to start to come to life in your own projects and in your own environment. Um, I think, Austin, can I, I know you you're like our, a super student and have done an amazing job sort of um, reaching out 
to your other teams and departments and capturing their needs and requirements. And you also work with an, another solution. I think it's Cognito Forms that you found has a connector to um, the Power Platform. Would you mind sharing a little bit about that with the group? Sure. So we we the whole organization uses Cognito Forms in a very various ways. So camper recruitment uses it to gauge, you know, camper families' interest in a particular weekend or being a part of a partnership. Um, I use it to, um, uh, or I guess my team uses it for constituents to communicate their um, communication preferences, uh, sign up for our newsletter, all sorts of things. And I've set up flows from Cognito um, to put the entries as they are received into uh, tables in Excel that are then shared amongst the team from our various OneDrives. Um, but yeah, so I'm looking, one of my wish list items, like Heather mentioned, is to take like the communication preferences form um, instead of just putting that into an Excel table and then I manually update it in the database. I want that process to just happen automatically as communications are submitted, mm -hmm. um, references are submitted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Austin. That's excellent. So again, um, the concepts that we sort of go through um, as we move into the next part of the presentation, think laterally and sort of try to put them within the context of your own environment. Um, and uh, and hopefully it'll help you as you start working on your own projects. So um, what we're gonna do today is really just go through an exercise. Um, the, the whole point of this session is to get you guys thinking primarily about what are the flows and what are the processes that you're trying to work on and try to visualize them. And so what we've got here is, this is a Visio chart and it's really geared towards mapping the process that we might need to go through um, when a complete stranger fills out a form. Now, as, as Heather and Zoya mentioned, um, we're gonna be using all the Microsoft tools here, so Microsoft Forms, and we're gonna use uh, obviously the Power Platform tools. Um, but you'll see as we go through, when we start looking at connectors, there's all kinds of them out there. And as Austin mentioned, I mean, she's already identified one using. So think about the, the, the in the real world scenario, Someone built a form. The form's waiting on the website. Somebody comes to that form. You have no idea who they are, and you want to capture some information from them, right? Name, address, email address, details about them, what, whatever that is, whatever connect, co combination of fields and, and data elements that is. This flow basically says, okay, we've got some fairly important data. We don't know anything about it, so what do we do? And so as you work through this flow, starting at the top left, somebody fills out that form and they hit submit. The steps that we're gonna go through are really about analyzing that data, understanding what is it that we just captured, and then attempting to do a search in Razor's Edge based on the data that was provided in the form. Depending on what happens, how many records do we find? If the person uh, is Jim Ballou, and you've already got a Jim Ballou in the database, now we need to teach the robot how do we identify that Jim Ballou? How do we make sure it's the right Jim Ballou? What if you have 10 Jim Ballous, right? So when you think about this flow, every one of these shapes is uh, 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 corresponding to some action, right? It's the form was filled out. We, in, we have an intake process. We're gonna analyze that data. We're going to do some calculations here, and then we're gonna have a decision matrix. And in, it, in order for this form to work, we wanted to keep it fairly simple. So we have three possibilities. Either when somebody fills out that form, we find no matches, in which case we wanna do something, which is defined over here on the far left, we're gonna create a new record. Or it has exactly one result. So we know Jim Ballou, that's Jim Ballou. You, sir, are Jim Ballou. And what do we wanna do? And then to throw a little spice in here, we said, well, even if this is really the right record, Maybe you don't want to just automatically overwrite fields in the database with whatever was filled out on the form. Maybe we want to get an approval. So we wanted to demonstrate kind of an approval process, which luckily the uh, Power Platform makes pretty easy. Um, and then the last element is, what if it's more than one match? That example where you might have 10 Jimbaloos in your database. Well, then 
we're going to get into a little bit more of this thought process of declaring a variable to store who we think the best match is, and then iterating through all 10 of those records to figure out which one should we actually be using. And then once we've decided, yep, we've got one, we've got a match, then either we're going to update an existing record or create a new one. So we'll keep referring back to this chart um, as we go through the process. But what I wanted to do is just really get you thinking about your own ideas, right? When somebody fills out a form, for example, what is it that you really do? And it's often convenient to think about if you were a human doing this, what would you do? Somebody walked up to you, gave you a piece of paper with Jim Ballou, uh, Jim Ballou at blackbud.com, my city state zip, whatever. Your first thing you're going to do is look up in, in the razor's edge. And so from a uh, 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 human perspective, if I open up razor's edge, I've got a search box here. Whoops. I've got a search box. And if I just type in Jim Ballou, the system's going to do a search. That is what we're going to accomplish automatically through Power Automate. What if it was somebody else, like um, Matt for shares? There's multiples. So we need to be able to account for all of these things. OK, so to get this process started, what I've got is a form that I created. And again, in the interest of time, I wanted to keep this as simple as possible. First name, last name, email address. This happens to be a Microsoft form. Um, again, just using that tool, it's convenient. So uh, use your form building tool uh, as you see fit. If there's one that you are the favorite for, um, certainly you can look into the Power Platform and see if the connectors are there. And those connectors are all listed under the connector area. All right, a couple of things that I wanted to really drive home, which Heather's already kind of stated, but I want to make sure that these are in the front of your mind as you think about your flows. That logic flow is your roadmap, right? We're building a logic flow here about how do we make sure that we don't accidentally add duplicate records to the database when something cool happens. You could build a logic flow for how do I make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? And all the steps that are involved with that process, we have to teach the robot because Power Automate is generic, right? It doesn't know anything about your business processes. It doesn't know anything about the razor's edge until you start looking at the connector there. So we need to spell those out. And that logic flow is really your roadmap, okay? So let's go ahead and start. Now, I'm gonna create a new flow. You can see uh, earlier this morning, I went through this entire process and believe it or not, it worked. Um, so I'm feeling pretty confident right now. Um, you can either choose to create a new flow, or if you go on the left-hand side, and I'm at flow.microsoft.com, um, you can choose to create. Either way, same process. When I create a flow, Microsoft has some built-in uh, kind of starting points, an automated cloud flow, meaning it's going to be triggered by something. It could be a scheduled cloud flow, meaning uh, every day at two in the morning, it's going to do some process and take care of business. I think you're going to be doing one of those next week with the gift uh, notification uh, 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 workflow that Trevor's going to work for you. So you can look at these. There are some templates that Microsoft has put forth, um, particularly around Microsoft products, right? Hey, when somebody adds something to a SharePoint list, we want to do something. We're not going to really touch too much on that because we're really focused on the flow that we kind of started with. So I'm going to do an automated cloud flow, and we're going to give it a name. And I'm going to call this one class for work. If I could type work shop. Two. All right. And the trigger that I'm going to select is based on Microsoft Forms. And fair enough, it's right here. Now, again, I can scroll down. There's all kinds of really interesting things that could trigger a flow. These are the ones that are simply highlighted. I'm going to choose this very first one because I'm waiting for data to be submitted on that form. When I hit create, it's going to take me into the palette. Now, this palette is where my workflow is going to exist. So my automation workflow has a visualization to it. And that's why we say that this is a uh, citizen developer tool rather than a pure programming tool, because these visual aids can help you kind of get a handle on what's going on without having to know, you know, for next loop terminology, for example. All right. So when that form is submitted, well, what form are we talking about? 
And the Power Platform makes it pretty easy, right? I have a selection of forms that I've used. I'm actually choosing this volunteer interest form because that happens to be the form that I started with over here, okay? So when that form is submitted, we need to do something. And again, thinking about how the robot views things, what I'm gonna do is get the response details, right? You could say, hey, when that form is submitted, go create an action on Jim's record saying, go check the form. Well, that's kind of silly. That makes work for me instead of removes work for me. So we're gonna take care of those steps as we go. So get response details. Again, it needs to know which form we're talking about because I could have five forms up on the website, but I'm gonna pick that same form. And then I have to decide, well, what is the response from this? What are we gonna do with that data? And how do we identify what that packet of data is gonna be? Remember, my form only has three fields, first name, last name, email address. Your form could be more complicated, but regardless of how many fields you're capturing there, we need to identify it for the robot. Now, Microsoft makes this pretty easy. They call it a, rep a response ID. This is an example, we'll see a bunch of this today, of dynamic content. So dynamic content knows what I'm doing here, and it's saying, well, you're talking about getting data from a form. Here are the dynamic content options for a form. I could have an expression which says, go do some calculation or something. I just want that response packet. So I choose that, and I'm ready to go. Now, I'm gonna keep harping on one concept which will save your bacon repeatedly, which is make sure when you are creating these actions, when you are building your flows, to give them names that make sense to you. When a new response is submitted, that might be okay. I could make that maybe a, a little more detailed by renaming this and say, when somebody fills out the volunteer interest form, okay? That tells me exactly what's going on here. Get the response details. I'm gonna rename that. Get committed data. Again, the names that you choose here aren't important so much as what th the fact that you are telling yourself, because three months down the road, you might wanna come back and change this. What was that step all about? I'll try to remember that as we go through. It's a good habit to be in because when you start getting into controls with arrays and things like that, it's real easy to get lost in it. And then you have to kind of work your way through it and waste a bunch of your time rebuilding or re-understanding what it is you did earlier. Okay, so we're gathering the data from that form. What do we wanna do with that packet of data? Remember that's first name, last name, email address. Well, we're gonna add a step. And rather than use some of these built-in connectors that Microsoft put together, we're going to the one that Blackbaud created. Now, if you type in whatever uh, you know name, look for Blackbaud, you're gonna come up with this green connector. That's the one you want. You notice I've got a red one there. That is an internal build that I had connected to earlier. You may or may not even see that. Um, look at that, it's incomplete. Red means stop in this case. But when you choose that green connector, this is the Blackbaud Razor's Edge connector. Uh, you actually may even see Blackbaud Financial Edge connector in there, right? There's all kinds of other stuff that Blackbaud's working on. But as I see this now, instead of, hey, when a form is submitted, or hey, when a line gets added to SharePoint, you see things that could happen within the Razor's Edge. Create a constituent alias, um, create custom fields, update, data. There's, there's hundreds of endpoint elements and actions that are up, up possible here, but this is all part of what Blackbaud has put forth. But what are we trying to do here? Well, I want to search based on the data that was submitted in that form. I want to do a record lookup. So all I have to do is start typing search, and it's going to find search for a constituent. When I choose search for a constituent, the most important thing is, well, what are you searching on? So remember when I went to the razor's edge, it was a line, I just typed into it. Well here, I don't want to physically type because I don't wanna be sitting here at two in the morning when that volunteer decided to submit their information. Instead, I want to choose the data packets from that form. So I wanna use first name, space, last name. That space is very important because when the razor's edge search function runs, it actually builds a string of whatever you've got in your search box. If there's no 
uh, space there, then it's going to search for Jim Ballou one record, one, uh, excuse me, one word. And guess what? There's no record with the name of Jim Ballou. There's a record with the first name of Jim and a last name of Ballou. So that's something that I know I've gotten hung up as I've uh, been building these, these flows. Uh, just be careful about that. Um, if you have multiple elements like this, you want to separate them as if you were typing them, because that's the way that the robot is going to interpret this. OK. So I've got a search. I'm going to rename this. Look up the record based on form data. OK. Any questions so far? This is all very linear. It looks like a telephone pole. That's about to change. We're about to get into branching logic here because there's a condition. If we refer back to our flowchart, that was all this stuff up here. Now we've got a decision to make. Based on what that search returns, zero, one, or more than one. So I want to build a condition. So for this condition, I'm going to use a built in uh, uh, applet, if you will, called a control. So add a new step, and there it is, front and center. It's used very often, so it's right here in the front. Now, the type of control could be a condition, if, this, or that. It's, it's binary, right? Either yes or no. You could do a loop, apply to each. There, there's other flavors of this. I actually didn't even get into some of these, but the one we're looking at is switch. Switch is like a condition that has an unlimited number of possibilities. So based on this switch, we need to do some evaluation. What are we going to evaluate? Well, when I click in the uh, uh, criteria here, it gives me dynamic content and it says, based on what you just accomplished, you did a record lookup. One of the things that's returned from that lookup is not just the ID of a record, right? or the name or the email address or the address or other things. It's the total number of records found in that search. That's our condition. So I'm gonna do a condition here. All I have to do is specify. And then I have these multiple cases. In the first situation, remember going back to our flow chart, first step is what if you find nobody? Easy enough, equals zero. And again, I'm gonna do some renaming. This is Evaluate how many results were returned. Search. OK. So if zero, we're going to do something. I'm going to add another one, this little plus. I can keep going and going and going. What if it's one? What if it's two? What if it's 50? Now, I only want three cases. So if it equals one, we're going to do something totally different. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't have the ability to say greater than one, but based on this logic, the results of this search have to be one of these three. Either it's zero or one, or it's something else, which happens to be more than one. It can't be a negative number. So we're just going to leave that one as it is. And now what we've got is the ability to specify what the outcome of this should be. And again, I'm going to rename. So it's easy peasy later on when I want to see what I just did. If no results are found, this one we're going to call if exactly one match is found. And this other one is just the, the rest of it. So from this process, what we're going to do is spell out what we want to happen. And going back to our flow chart, what do we want to happen? Well, we want to create a new record. So I've found, I've got some forms data. I've searched against Razor's Edge. I didn't find any matches. So capture that data and create a new record. I'm going to add an action. This is also going to be a blackboard action because I'm going to create a new constituent record. The naming here you'll get used to. Um, if you say create constituent, it will get to you here, but it'll also show you a bunch of other constituent, like create constituent action, create constituent uh, appeal, right? 
I happen to know that this was called create an individual constituent because I could also do create an organization constituent, but these happen to be humans because they filled out the form. So when I say create an individual constituent, I have razor's edge fields listed out. Now you notice the first one is required. It's got a little asterisk next to it. Okay, you can't have a record without an, a, a last name. And again, any of your required fields in razor's edge are going to be behaved that way. But what I want to do is say, okay, what do I want to put in last name? Well, remember, I've still got all those razor's edge fields here, but if I scroll down a little bit, I can see the data that was submitted from the form. Remember back up at the top when we captured the form data? That's what makes this possible. So I want to put last name. And then I'm going to do first name. And of course, I could search here and type in uh, email, for example, and that will narrow this down so it's easy to find the right fields. But if I go to the advanced options over here, all of the fields that I can add in one fell swoop are here. Now, email is a little different, right? Last name, first name, those are discrete single fields in the database. But how many emails could somebody have? And what goes along with an email? Well, it has a type, right? So I can't just say, give me the field that says email and put a type on or, or uh, uh, just use it, right? I have to actually define it. So when we say email type, this dropdown actually takes me into the razor's edge table structure and shows in my sample database, I only have an email type called email. If you have more, they would all be listed and you could simply, you know, choose the one that you want. The last thing I want to do here is put that email address in place. So what we've done is we've said, we're going to use the create an a, a constituent action from Blackboard. We're gonna populate that new record with this information, and then we're good to go. Now, there are other things that you can take care of here. So for example, remember our scenario is that this is a volunteer interest form. What if you wanted to add a constituent code to that record to indicate that they were a volunteer, for example. Constituent code is not one of the fields listed here, but guess what? I can add another action. Go back to Blackboard, and I can create a constituent code. There it is, create a constituent code. So if I choose that, again, it says, well, what are we doing? Guess what? I could add a constituent code to any record. I don't want that to happen. I want it to go to the specific record that I just created. And Power Automate is smart enough to know, well, you just created a record. Maybe you want that ID. So I choose that ID. And then just like I did with the email type, I can drop down all of the constituent codes that are in my system. I'm going all the way to the bottom and I want to add volunteer. Now, there's other stuff that I can populate here, like start day, start time, or start year, month, that kind of thing. I'm going to hold off on doing any of that for this exercise because this gets into some fairly complicated date time expressions. Um, and I'm going to actually punt on those for today because Trevor is going to show you that stuff next week when we do the uh, email notification stuff. So just keep in mind that once I have created that record, I could go add custom fields. I could uh, put an address on there if I captured that, right? I could update, uh, add a relationship. There's really no limit to the things that I can do to that constituent record to make it look the way that I want according to my organization's uh, business policies. Questions so far? We have one question. Go ahead, take yourself off mute, Dan. Yeah, um, so my question is, um, are required fields, like if, if you have a required fields, are they honored? Like would it prevent you, let's say you had um, like title as a required field. If you didn't put a title in, would that stop the flow or would you be able to continue? That is a great question, Dan. I believe it will, but let me test. And the reason I'm not absolutely certain on it is that the required field functionality 
in NXT is not as comprehensive as it is in database view. So I got to check to see if, you know, the fields that you've made required through the web view um, are respected here. I would think they are, but let me test on that. and We can get back to you. Thanks. Good question. Yeah. Okay. So let's carry on. Again, I've got three possible options, three results from that search. What happens if we find one and only one match? So in this case, we're going to do something a little different. We don't want to just automatically update that one record. We could, right? But you probably are uh, thinking that's like fingernails on a chalkboard, right? You don't want to just stomp on data without somebody knowing what just happened. What if this was a board member, right? And it changed their name from James to Jimmy or something like that. Again, not out of the realm of possibility. So what we want to do is actually build an approval. Now, Microsoft has an approval applet built into the Power Platform, which makes it really, really easy to do this. You need to think about how it's going to work, but you don't have to go and invent these things. So when I choose the approvals, you could uh, you know, wait for approval from something else. You could create an approval and send it to a totally different flow. What we're going to focus on here is start and then wait for a response. So think about this. In the real world, if you want to get some ice cream and you have to go and ask your mom or your dad, can I get some ice cream? You go and you make the ask and then you wait. And they either say yes or they say no. That's what we're telling the robot to do here. Okay. So we're going to start and wait for an approval. I'm going to rename this one to wait for somebody to approve. Now, there are multiple types of approvals that you can build in the Power Platform. Um, you could, for example, have an approval that has to go to four people before it is fully approved, right? So it goes to four managers and every one of them has to bless that action before the robot picks it up and does the next step with it. You could say, send it to five people or four people, but whoever responds first, it's okay. They all have the same authority, right? You could say, um, you know, when somebody approves, it's not just hit a button to say approve or reject they could have to put in a response, right? Like add this as a new record, and then you could evaluate that. So there's a lot of kind of sophisticated things you could do with this. Again, trying to keep this as simplistic as possible. I'm just gonna say everybody must approve. And when we build this, I'm only gonna send it to one person. So it will work out just fine. So the rest of this approval process is what do you need to tell the recipient of that approval? in order for them to make an informed decision. Well, there's going to be a title. And I'm just going to put in form data matches a record in NXT. That's kind of the subject line of the email. And then who is this assigned to? Now, remember, this is Microsoft. We happen to use Outlook 365 or Office 365 at Blackbot. So if I just start typing, it's actually going to pull out of my contact book who I'm looking at. I thought that was kind of cool. I could add multiples here. You could separate them by, I believe, semicolons. Um, but if there, again, were there four people you needed to notify and get approval from, that's where you would do that. The details is what do you want to tell them? Now, this is where you can get creative. I'm going to keep this pretty simplistic because I'm not great at HTML or you know formatting tables. There are ways to do that. You'll see one of them next week when you build your gift uh, 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 digest daily digest but for this what i want to say is um you know who's the form and what do we what do we think they match to okay so i'm going to say form data and remember i'm pulling from the form not from the record oops it put the cursor in the wrong spot there and email address. 
So what I'm doing here is I'm just building the notification, right? I'm saying, what am I going to show to this person? Well, here's what came in off the form. But they might also want to know what we think it matches to. And again, here I'm not limited to what the form provided. I actually have access to all kinds of stuff here. So what I'm going to do is say name. And I'm going to put some blackboard fields in there. And there's the email. And then at the end of it, I'm going to make it even easier. Constituent ID so they know this is record number whatever. Now let me pause here for a moment. We talked about this a little bit last week. This is the first time we've actually had to differentiate between the constituent ID and the record ID. Let's take a look at this. Now I'm going to jump over to my Razor's Edge database and I'm going to pull up a record so we can see exactly what I'm talking about. The way that I differentiate between system record ID and constituent ID is this. The constituent ID is what humans typically think about. The record ID is typically what robots think about and computers think about. So when you think about the, the record ID, that is a behind the scenes unique identifier for this record. I'm record number 755, my record here. But if you were to go into the search and type in 755, you're not gonna come up with Jim Ballou you're going to come up with a record that has a constituent ID of 755. So this is kind of a front end number. I'm number 260, but the robots think about me as record 755. Now, why is this? When databases are built, actually Razor's Edge has dozens of unique IDs. These are simply the two most prevalent, right? There are record IDs for gifts, for actions, for relationships, for attachments, for everything because the robot needs to know how to handle those things. A constituent ID is a front end field that can actually be controlled by you guys, right? A user could type in and say, I wanna make this person record our constituent ID, JJ1480, you know, if you want it, as long as that's a unique number, right? But so when you think about your robot, here I'm putting something in front of a constituent. If I say record 755, that's not gonna help them they're going to want to see that lookup ID. So we call it the lookup ID here. Um, I have, could take a, uh, an exception with some of our nomenclature because I would think we would call that constituent lookup ID or something along those lines. Um, but there you have it. It's just a, one of the quirks of how programmers think about this stuff. All right, so what I've got now, let me just step back in here. I've got a notification that's going to go out that says, here's the form data. Here's the record information and there's their, their lookup ID. And then we are going to wait, okay? So that notification goes out, that approval goes out and it's waiting for somebody to, to respond. At this point, now we're going to take action. What if somebody approves it? This is a control, okay? happens to be a condition because it's either that it's approved or not. Now the condition is, was it approved? And again, Microsoft makes this nice and easy. That approval has its own ID. It's got completed date. It's got details. It's got comments, remember the response, right? But all I'm looking for here is the outcome, which is either approved or rejected. So if the outcome equals approve, now I have a decision to make. Pause here for a moment. Jim, I got an answer on the required fields I've been posting in the chat. They're respected okay. and it would show up, um, it would throw an asterisk on the connector anywhere where you've got a required field and you're not gonna be able to save the flow without entering. 
something in the like with the last name. It would be like that for all your required fields. Awesome. So the answer is yes. That is the correct answer. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. Yeah. So let me just pause here for a moment. I'm going to zoom out so you can see what's going on here. Remember, we started off looking like a telephone pole. It was very linear. And then we got to the switch where there were three parallel possibilities, zero, one, or more than one. Well, if there were zero matches, again, it's pretty straightforward. Add the data, create a new record, code it appropriately. If it's exactly one, we kind of took a little detour, which is another uh, uh, kind of decision uh, situation where it says, okay, you've got one match, go get approval. If it is approved, then we want to do something else. And if we refer back to our flowchart, if it is approved, we're going to update the record. If it's not approved, then there's something else we might do, right? Maybe we send an email to somebody with the form data and say, go do it yourself, right? Jim? Yeah. Could you just sort of point out why it created that loop there that apply to each loop? Oh, like yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. This is, again, as an English major, when I look at this, sometimes I'm like, well, what is it doing here? When you have a switch, all it knows is that the outcome of this switch is going to be some integer, right? It's going to be, see a, it's going to be a number, but it doesn't know how many or what number it is until it evaluates it. So if it's zero, it knows, okay, great, just do something. But if a, a number is found, it's going to loop through. So this apply to each, is it, it's a little funny because it's looping through a collection of one. That's just the way that the robot thinks about this. When we do the third option, it's going to build a similar loop. But remember, there could be 10 Jimbaloos in your database. So it'll loop through 10 times. So when you think about that apply to each, that's just saying, check this data for the records in this situation, what do we want it to do? That's the way I understand this. And the key point there is, is that yes, you can create your own loop, which is apply to each, but Microsoft Power Platform sometimes thinks it's smarter than you. The robot thinks it's smarter <laughs> than you. And it will automatically create those loops if the integer is one or more, right? If it yeah. has things to evaluate, like a list. So just be careful because it's automatically going to create those loops. And as you get more sophisticated and more sophisticated, you're going to have apply to each inside of apply to each inside of apply to each inside of apply to each. So that's why it's important. This one's pretty easy to sort of rename it because then you need to make sure that you're adding your next action and sort of considering if it's that inside of the loop Am I applying that to each or is that outside of the loop, right? That's an excellent, and, I, and, excellent and, point. and the reason why I'm bringing that up is we've had students who have graduated who have come back that have just been like, I can't get this flow to work. I know I'm doing it right. And we take one look at it and say, look where the action is. You got it inside the loop instead of outside the loop. Move it outside the loop, flow, flow is fine. And you know, you've now spent 10 hours pulling your hair out. So. Um, just just be really careful because the system will sometimes create loops and you just want to be mindful when that happens and say, okay, do I need a loop there? Is, is the robot, are, are we are we in my meld or has he, they have the robot created a loop that need not be there? Um, so just sort of look as those loops are created. Yeah, and, and the, the Power Platform makes it fairly easy to understand where you are because of these little boxes, right? So this this entire box here if exactly one record is found everything in that box is contained within that scenario okay if no results are found you've got all of this stuff it's within that box for this loop evaluate the one result and get approval well the approvals within this box that's inside the bigger box so again it, it's easy to get kind of uh turned around here but the more you do this, um, the more you'll kind of get the hang of it. Um, and I will say, um, this may not be the first time you hear this, your flows are going to fail. They will. It's just human nature. I have worked on flows for hours and hours and hours. 
and each time it fails because I've put it in the wrong loop or I've, I've, I've gotten outside of the loop to do a task that meant to be inside or vice versa, it's okay. It's a learning process. And as you build these, you'll get the hang of it. Um, and that's also, of course, why we have the office hours, right? So that if you're working on your projects, um, we can give you advice, we can help review, um, and it, it's a, a collaborative effort. Okay, so what I've got now is, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm waiting for approval and I have a decision to make. Was it approved or not? So if the outcome is equal to approved, then I'm gonna do something. And if we referred back to our flow chart, we wanted to update the record with the fields from the form. And again, this, keep in mind, this is simplistic. That may not be the way that you want to handle this, uh, but for our flow, I wanted to keep it pretty straightforward here. So again, I'm gonna do something with the razor's edge data. So I'm going back to the Blackboard connector. And instead of creating a record, I'm gonna update a record. And let me zoom in so you can read that a little more easily. There we go. So I'm updating a constituent. It's the third one down here, update a constituent. When I choose that, similar to what we saw before, but there are some differences here. It's not just asking for last name, it's actually saying, give me the constituent ID, the ID, the system record ID of the record that you found in your process. So if I scroll down, the system record ID, and by the way, when you're looking at the dynamic content, this refers back to the step that you've gone through, right? So look up the record. This process right here, if it came back with one, I've ended up in this flow. And that IntelliSense, if you will, is telling me, here we go, is telling me, well, it's the record that you ha still have in memory, basically. So when I scroll down here, look up the record based on the form data, here's the record ID. So that's going to be 755 if it, was, if it was my record. And then I'm simply plugging in the fields from the form, just like before. First name, last name. Now, this is a little bit different from creating a new. Remember the new record, I had the ability to just plug an email address with a type in here, but we can't do that when the record already exists, not in one fell swoop. And the reason is, remember, I could have 40 email addresses on my record. I hope not, but I could have two, right? So then do we want to update an existing email address or create a brand new one? Now, again, for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to add another action and it's going to create a brand new email address for this existing record. Create a constituent email address. Okay. System record ID of the record that we're still on. I'll go grab that guy again. And then just like I did before, I'm going to choose the email type. All this waiting for it to say email. I know. I, know. It's, <laughs> I was like, what's going on there? And then from here, go back to my form email. You notice, hopefully everybody's seen, these things are nice and color coded, right? That kind of uh, teal green is the form data. This bright green is blackboard. Purple is approval, right? I rely true. on it pretty heavily. It's true. The color coding is helpful, but again, as you get more sophisticated, you know, the example that we talked about in the slides of matching the volunteer record to the beneficiary record, both of those were get constituent calls. Yeah. So that's why renaming it is critical to say get the volunteer record. Now get get the beneficiary record and mm -hmm. then you got to make sure you're in the right section when you're finding the ID, right? So who are you talking about and making sure you're pulling the data packet from the right call? You, if you've got multiple calls and they're all green and they all say get a constituent, <laughs> a constituent two, you're not going to know. 
who you're, you're in a world of hurt. You're in a world basically. of hurt. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to finish this process by creating a constituent code for that existing record. Remember? So I found the record. Who is it? It's going to be the ID, not of the email address. Remember, that has its own ID. We want to go down to the constituent data, grab that ID from the search process, and then again, I could just start typing. And it'll do IntelliSense and find the information. Okay, so per Heather's point, I'm going to go back and rename these things so that it's very, very clear. Austin, that's a good question. So um, asking if you're updating a record and you want to apply a constituency code, but that um, constituent might already have that constituency code, do you need to build in that business logic into the flow or is it smart enough to know not to overwrite it? Uh, you're going to build that into the flow. So again, there would be a, a, a loop, right? A condition which would say, search that record and return a list of all of the constituent codes on that record. And if it equals, you know, you declare a variable and say, if it equals volunteer, then the variable, you know, capture that. If it doesn't, then, you know, go on. We're actually going to do that process with the third element here. Um, but you're right. You're going to have to teach the robot every little step. Remember the peanut butter and jelly analogy, right? Everybody knows how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But if you were teaching a robot, you'd have to say, first, get the bread out of the drawer. Second, unpack the bread, right? Pull the bread out of the, the bag. Put the twist tie back on. Put the bread on the plate. Get a plate first, right? So you got to map out that entire process. When you are thinking about adding new data to records, it's critical, right? You want to think carefully because you could very easily end up with a record with multiple of the same code on there, which is not good eats, right? That, that's, that's not the way you want to see your data. In fact, we've had a student project. Um, this is Volunteers of America, formerly part of our accelerator course, and all of their affiliates are in a shared NXT environment, and it's all powered by constituent security. So if they don't have the code on for the affiliate, sort of the whole system falls apart. So their student project was simply to go look for records that didn't have this constituency code and then based on the location information add the constituency code um, so yes you know, austin there's a lot of scenarios and it would overwrite the data so you've got to build that business logic into the flow so i actually haven't tried this but it should be possible for you to build that specific task as a Lego building block as its own flow. Mm -hmm. so, exactly. so, so Austin, what you could do is say, or and maybe everybody does this, is you build a simple flow which says, examine the constituency codes, the array of constituent codes that exists on any given record. And if you find the input value that I'm looking for, in this case, volunteer, then stop. But if you don't find it, then add the new code, right? And so that you could build that in a way in Power Automate so that that's its own Lego building block. And then when you go to add an action, you could say, oh, go reference this other flow, right? Mm -hmm. Programmers like to do this kind of stuff all the time. They build little snippets of code that exist just in case, mm -hmm. right? And so that, that's a handy way to think about that. Now, I, I say it should be possible because I have not built a flow to depend on that, but that might be something cool we could do um, maybe for an advanced class or 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 something along those lines, Heather. Yeah. I'll talk to Trevor about that one. But we could also certainly look at ways to build some flows like that and then make them available, right? Mm -hmm. Again, it's not not strictly plug and play because you will have to uh, understand how those other those kind of sub, uh, uh, subservient flows exist, what the inputs need to be, and what the return would be. Um, but that's certainly a way to think about the power of platform. Uh, mm -hmm. Remember, this is this is essentially mimicking a programming environment. It is a programming environment, but you don't have to know C sharp, right, or Java or whatever. Exactly. Okay. Good questions. Other questions before we jump into this third one. This is where we start getting a little more gnarly, right? Everything we've done so far was fairly straightforward. Um, that approval feature 
is built into the Power Platform, so we really didn't have to think too hard about that. Now we're going to get into some actual variables. We're going to get into this idea because remember, in this scenario, there could be 10 or 50 Jim Baloo's in your database. Hopefully not, right? I'd like to think I'm one of a kind, but, but let's say there are multiple records. We need a way to evaluate which one we really want to deal with. And the way that you do that is through the use of a variable. So I always like to think of variables as, as like a scratch paper, right? It's just a placeholder. So in order to uh, uh, really do a complex operation like this, the robot can think of a lot of things, but not all at the same time. So what we want to do is we want to declare a variable. We create a variable, and then we use it as a placeholder, as a scratch sheet, to store data temporarily. Now, variables have some quirkiness to them. The first thing you need to know is that if you're going to use a variable, it must be at the top level of the flow. You can't put a variable uh, within this loop, for example. It, it won't work. It'll actually say, no, you can't do that. Where you put it doesn't really matter. You could have the very first thing be create a variable. I like to come here because I've already done my record lookup, and I know my next step is to do something with that variable. So I'm going to add an action. And fair enough, you type in variable. There it is, bright purple. Now, variables are a specific concept in programming, right? The first thing you have to do is you have to initialize the variable. Then that scratch paper is blank and it's waiting for you. When you are doing your logical operation, then based on what happens in that evaluation, you set the variable. You say, store this data on my scratch paper. So here we're gonna initialize the variable. And what you need to do is give it a name that you will recognize. So this is gonna be matched record ID is what I wanna call this one. And rather than just a generic initialize variable, I'm gonna rename this to set or initialize, create a matched record ID variable. And again, you'll get more comfortable with your naming up here. This is just my kind of scratch notes about what is happening here. The other thing that you need to know about is this type. And this looks a little scary, right? For me, at least. Boolean is yes, no. Integer is number. I'm honestly not sure what float is. If there's a programmer on the call, they'd probably be able to explain that. String float is, is the a one. Uh, float is a number that has um, uh, decimal points, right? Got it, okay like a currency or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. What we're looking for here though is a string. And the reason is a string is text, right? You know that record IDs um, or constituent IDs can be alphanumeric. Think in the cloud, you could have an ID that is called a GUID. I don't know if anybody's ever heard that GUID, that's Global Unique Identifier. And that's one of these like 400 character strings um, that some systems will use. Luckily, Blackbot doesn't require you to do that. Um, we are you gonna use the record ID, but it is still a string. So all I've done here is say, okay, I know that it's possible. I might need to scratch down some information while I'm evaluating some more advanced logic. So we're gonna call it the matched record ID, okay? I go back down to my switch and I'm looking at that third option. We've already handled zero. We've handled one. Now we're going to go for more than one. Okay. So we're going to add an action here. And it's going to be a condition. And the condition here is yes, no, but it's not like a count of records. For my logic, based on my flowchart, what I wanted to do is if I had more than one, then I wanted to do some logic around whether the email address matched. So I've already matched based on first name, last name. Remember, that was my first search criteria. But I've got that third little piece of data, which might just get me to the specific record that I want or help me eliminate others. 
right? So what I want to do is do some logic here that is going to show me the email from the form compared to a constituent email. So that's my condition. And again, it minimized that for some reason. But that's the condition. Does what was submitted on the form match to email from the records that were in that collection? Remember, there's 10 Jim Baloo's. Some of them may have an email. Some of them may have multiple emails, right? But this is going to compare that form email, the one that was submitted, to what I've got in the database. And then it's just a yes, no from there on, right? Now, the trick is, remember that variable. I haven't done anything with it yet. It's sitting there waiting. If the form email equals the razor's edge email, then I want to scratch down the information about that record. And the easiest way to do that is to set the variable And it knows it's called the matched record ID because that's what I called it. And the value is going to be the record ID of the record where the email matches the form. Is everybody with me there? Looks good. We have that's, about 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna we're, we're gonna kind of wrap this up here. If it doesn't match. I want it to go back and do the rest of the loop. So remember this applied to each up here. What I really want this to say is loop through the search results. Find based on email. Now I'm going to leave that. I'm not going to do the, uh, uh, the spell check here. Now, once I have got that condition, I'm still in that loop. Right. So I'm going to add an action. And based on this, what am I going to do? Well, I need to decide is that, uh, did I find a record? Is that variable populated? Now, there's a very specific way to do this. Okay. So I need to add the condition here. So this is a third condition we've done, but this condition is. Did we find a record? Did we find a match? Now, remember my variable. Because I don't know the record ID, I can't say, is it equal to 755? Instead, I want to write an evaluation, an expression that will tell me whether anything is in that variable. The expression is the length of that field. So if I type in length, actually, let me try that again. The end, there we go. Length, and then I can go back to the dynamic content and I can put in the length of that variable. So the, the way I did that very quickly is you type in the expression and you open a parentheses. And then inside that parentheses, you're going to go back to the dynamic content and sp specify the variable because that's what I'm evaluating here. So now, if, no, nope, I didn't do it. Let's try that one more time. For the cheap seats, do it again. Yeah, I know, hang on. There we go. Length, open parentheses, go back to the dynamic content, choose the variable, and hit OK. There we go. So that will tell me whether I've got any data. How do I know? Because the length is going to be greater than or equal to one. So if it loops through all of those search records, remember the 10 Jim Baloo's, and it can't find any match, the length will be zero and it won't do anything. But if it does find a match, then I've got a yes scenario, in which case I could go do my approval process like I did before, or create a new record, or send an email to somebody to say, hey, I found a record, you need to, to review this personally. 
Does that make sense to everybody? We got Question. some thumbs up. All right. I'm going to very quickly just update an existing. And then I'm going to show you how to test this process. Um, update a constituent. And again, just for sim simplicity's sake here, I'm going to update using that match record ID. First name. And uh, you get the point, right? I mean, I could fill out the rest of my fields, my email address, put a constituent code on it, do whatever I need to. OK. At this point, if I zoom out, you can see there's a lot of stuff going on here, right? Some of them are more complicated than others. This was the zero. This was the exactly one, and this was more than one. Okay. At this point, what I want to do is test this. So I'm going to save my workflow. It's going to tell me it's saving, and then it says we recommend you test it. Fair enough. There is a flow checker, which they will run on command, which will say, hey, did you forget something? Maybe you misdeclared a variable or there's something that you forgot to fill out. This is a pretty handy little tool. But the most important part here is this little test option. So when I say test, I want it to happen manually, right? Because I'm going to go fill out this form. And now it is waiting on a response. So I'm going to come here to my form. Fill out my information. Submit. Form says great, ready to go. Now the flow is actually running. Now what's cool about this, you see these little green boxes? Those are successes. It worked, right? If I drill in, I can actually see what happened. So it found Jim Ballou. Here's what it searched on. And here's the record that it found. And it's not just what I was using, right? It's got my address. It's got whether I'm deceased, inactive, right? This is all based on that endpoint or that connector that BlackBot built. Then if I get down to my switch, I can see, oh, one result was found. Well, guess what? That's only the middle column here. This one with zero results. This was more than one. This is the one that's dealing with. So if I look at this, it's been sitting here for 44 seconds. You know why? Because it's waiting for someone to approve this. If you notice down at the bottom of my screen, I've actually got my Teams open. Approval works in Teams and email. If I had my email open, you would actually see the email. I, I've got to, took a screenshot of one earlier. But this is what that approval looks like. It says, oh, you need to approve something. Here's the form data. Here's the record data. What do you want to do? I can approve it, I can reject it, or I can just ignore it. Now I'm going to approve. And then if we jump back into the flow, hopefully in a second, oh, yeah, everything got it. worked. Everything worked. Now, if you wanted to retest, you want to show them that little trick before we let them go? Because this was a huge time saver for people. You don't have to fill out the form again. I don't know that one, Heather. Oh, How do you do that? Well, maybe I misspoke, but if you go back <laughs> to that. Yeah, go go to the scroll, scroll to the right. I, yeah. I think it's on the back screen. You got to go back to the flow. So go back to the flow right there with the arrow. Yep. And go in to edit the flow. We all get to things a little bit different, right? And then if you go back up to test. Yeah. Then you can say um, automatically, right? It should work with a recently used. Oh, oh, oh. all right. That's cool. I didn't know that because I was filling so up. Now, it's like, yeah. you know, we had a student that, you know, was doing <laughs> testing a flow with dropping a Excel file into a SharePoint folder. And she had to keep taking the file and putting in the SharePoint folder. And she was saying, no, uh, just go here and actually use that same trigger and run it again. So the lucky thing is, is your flow worked on the first time. Yours probably will not. 
So this is a huge <laughs> sort of time saver to, so you're not sitting there filling out your Jim Ballou form 400 times in a row. This, I will say, this isn't my first time building this flow. I did it probably six times in the last 48 hours, just making sure that I had all my talking points and everything. So you will, your flows are gonna fail and it's okay. So one thing that we will do after this course or after today's session, we will also export this flow and put that file, it'll create a zip file and you have the ability just like with last week to import this flow. Now, this isn't complete. I don't wanna convey that this is ready for prime time, right? your business policies are going to have to be considered. Meaning, do you really want to update a record based on an email match? I don't know, right? These are decisions that, that, that humans have to make. But once you've decided how you want to handle that scenario, then you can take this flow or something similar to it and automate all the steps that are okay to automate. Awesome. Well, we're just at time, so thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it for today. Hope you found today useful.